Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. Uh, we're welcoming back Richard Schwartz, um, Bay Area historian who's been here several times before, uh, but not since the pandemic started, right? Correct. So um, we have him here to talk about Berkeley in the year 1900 and uh, to find out exactly whether it deserved its nicknames back then that it has now. So thanks a lot for joining us, Richard. And uh, if you have any questions, well, first, uh, two small things that make sure that you have your phones turned off so that we don't have interruptions. And the other thing is, if you have any questions, we'll do that at the end of his talk. And uh, we'll, we'll arrange for a microphone and a, a place to stand for that. So, Richard, thanks to come back. Thanks Thank for you for back. coming out in the, in the rain. Um, I tend to think that this rain and fog is perfectly conducive to walking through. Then when you're in that fog, you come out and you're in 1900. It just makes it easier. And I live in Berkeley, so I can talk like that. So. Um, Many years ago, I went to my local historical society, and while I was sitting there, I heard them say, we're going to throw those 100-year-old newspapers in the dumpster today. And like a jack-in-the-box, I jumped up and said, I'll take them without thinking, and um, lugged them home. You know, they're bound volumes, and made the mistake of putting one on my dining room table. And I opened it up, and this is the first article I read, and it's about Mary Shapelin. Uh, she was in, in her 30s. She had been feeling ill, and, but she got herself out of bed and dressed in the classic outfit of the day, which was a, a white skirt below her ankles. A woman was not allowed to show her ankles back then and keep her reputation, and one of those big fluffy blouses. I, I have no idea what they're called. <clears throat> she went outside. And the neighbor across the street ran up to her and said, your next door neighbor, whom her house was attached to, uh, was an elderly woman and had just gotten home from the hospital with heart failure. And she said, your neighbor's roof is on fire. And they were both afraid that if they told her that, it would kill her. So Mary jumped into action. She told the neighbor across the street to grab a garden hose. Mary grabbed the ladder, ran around the back of the house, threw it against the house, ran up this ladder, and it wasn't high enough to get to the roof. But she saw, as fate would have it, there were wooden cleats nailed to the building, and she grabbed onto them and propelled herself onto the roof. And she now sees the fire. She realizes that her blouse and dress would catch fire. This is 1905. She takes her blouse off, throws it to the ground, takes her dress off, throws it to the ground, gets the neighbor to throw up the hose. She runs to where there's a fire. With her bare hands and this garden hose, she's pulling up burning shingles for 15 minutes. I mean, that's an incredibly long time. And she's able to put the fire out. Uh, you know, her hands were burned and all that, didn't matter. At which point the fire department comes. <laughs> and the fire's out and they offer to help her down. She goes, I'm fine. She goes down by herself and she, she was like a heroine after that. I read that article and I realized that these newspapers contain such important history that they can't be owned by one person. Everyone has to know about these. And I called up the historical side, you gotta take these back, these are way too, no, we're not taking them back. <laughs> For weeks, I wanted to go on my porch, as soon as I read this and yell, Mary Shapelin, in the four cardinal directions, <laughs> just because she earned it. And I did it once, I didn't wanna do it more than once. <laughs> um, so what happened was, that was like my transformation. So I lugged a volume after work to the copy store and copied Xerox articles that rang a bell for me. I had 30 piles of articles on my living room floor and all the animals are carefully walking around the piles. And in retrospect, I felt like Richard Dreyfus making that clay model of devil's post file. He didn't know why. I didn't know why I was doing this and it didn't matter to me. One day I get home from work, open the door, and I see these piles, and I go, 
That's how I'm gonna fulfill my responsibility. Those are 30 chapters to a book. And that's the genesis of this book, which has 30 chapters. Um, so let's go back. Um, things were so different. I, I, it was really shocking. Um, as, you, as you look on the left, there's incredible flowers. That's right east of Wildcat Canyon, which is now covered by houses. It was an absolutely immense, world famous nursery. And uh, it's called Salbach Gardens. Nobody ever heard of it, nobody knows about it. They, ha they had flowers shipped all around the world. Thousands of people would come to visit it. There were orchids, there were special irises called Berkeley Hills irises, dahlias, gladiolas. Um, you know, it was, it was an incredible place, and it's nobody knows. Uh, down at the bottom right, you'll see Strawberry Creek. Now, it doesn't take much to realize, well, that's probably because there were strawberries along the creek banks, uh, which is true. But the other thing there was is watercress. Uh, and the early residents in diaries would talk about picking these things, and uh, it was totally different. Here's the rhyolite boulders of North Berkeley, and the rhyolite boulders east of the Hayward Fault, which runs north-south, are probably from Sibley, the Sibley Volcano in Sibley Regional Park, 10 million years old. The rhyolite to the west of the fault traveled a few centimeters per earthquake from Los Angeles area to get here. So, and, th and they only discovered this about 10 years ago, if that. Um, this made the area magical. And the Native Americans were all over it. You see all the coast live oaks. The neighborhood is now called Thousand Oaks with good reason. Um, down below, you see what there used to be uh, on the western edge of Berkeley. It was a beach called Bath Beach. Bath because it was shallow descending into the bay, so the water was really warm. You could take a bath in it. But the other thing was, there was so much wildlife at this beach. There were crabs and, and um, clams, and you could just go down there, and you know, if you ate shellfish, you could just pick them up and have them for dinner. Some people made a living there. It turns out that the sand was extremely valued. Alameda used to have the most valuable sand before they discovered this Berkeley sand. Anybody wanna guess why it's valuable? For construction, because the sand there is angular and not round. If it was round, it would have been rolled and rolled and rolled. It wouldn't help the sand adhere to the cement. So this was the most valued sand in, in the bay and they sold it for 25 cents a load, whether it was a bucket or a wagon load. And although I still have a hard time believing this, they took all the sand. And that was the end of the beach and the end of the wild. So next time you're riding over Route 80, south of Albany Hill, remember Bath Beach. Uh, this is Cerrito Creek, the northern boundary. That canyon, is so deep in spots, it's staggering. Uh, was a very important place. Um, up top right, you see what are called BRMs, bed rock mortars. So you have big boulders and the Indians put mortars in there. And don't for one minute think that, the, oh, those are for acorns, they ate acorns. No, uh, those are for grass seed, wild grass seed and wild flower seed and many other things, but not acorns. Um, then you can see in this lower right, two women are going back down into Strawberry Creek. Uh, you know, it was still a natural area. This is another view of the vast vistas that were afforded in the hills, the low hills in North Berkeley. But you'll notice um, the trees on the right, anybody wanna guess what they are? Exactly, good job. Um, these were planted 
uh, starting around the 1870s. They, they were good for windbreaks. They were amazing for planting on a damp lot and it would suck up all the water. <clears throat> and what Americans, being the commodity capitalists that Americans seem to gravitate towards, called it God's gold or nature's gold because they believed that if they planted these in 20 years, they could harvest a crop of them and make a fortune. It, it wasn't the case, but uh, that's why you see them there. And you also see them in the distance, um, you know, back near the back. Why isn't this? Okay, so, oops. Now, as the town grew, by 1900, there was about 13, a little over 13,000 people in Berkeley. So they had to have a reliable water supply. And this reservoir, North Berkeley Reservoir, then called Reservoir Number Two, uh, supplied that for the, for the town in that area. It still exists, and it's right east across Euclid from the Rose Gardens. It's still there. And I wanna point out, you know, this works, but it doesn't show up on the screen. Okay, I can pretend to be flexible as well as the next person. Um, that huge rock, look how it defines the landscape. That's Pinnacle Rock, which is today nestled in Remillard Park in the Berkeley Hills. And if you walk around to the back of it, you can still see that incredible steep rise and barely anybody knows about it or goes to that park. It's, it's an incredible place. And remember this, because it's gonna come up in a later story. This is called, well, originally, in, in this era, it was called El Capitan, but it was before that in Spanish days called Monument Rock. This very rock was used in the um, land grant ceremony in 1821 of L Louis Maria Peralta from the Spanish government. They did this very specific uh, ceremony to give him the land, and this was a boundary marker. And his sons took colored pebbles and stuck them in the crevices of that rock as part of the ceremony. And I've looked for them, I, I even went, there's now a house right behind it and there's a rail around the top, and, but I've gone in their crawl space looking for those pebbles. I haven't found them yet, but I'm not done looking. I'm never done. This is a view from North Berkeley out to the bay in Mount Tamalpais. What a place. Now, let's, let's surprise ourselves. Um, what you see here is log, log raft adrift in the bay. So what does this mean? Well, there weren't roads from the Pacific Northwest to the bay that you could get 10 million feet of logs. Even if there were roads, you didn't have the mechanical vehicles that could do it. And even if you did, the cost would have been way more than you could get for the logs. So what did they do? They would, and this is an actual photograph, they would make 10 million feet of logs, 10 million feet. The biggest logs were often like six feet in diameter by 150 feet long. Um, and they would bind them together with cable and you can see the toe, uh, the toe in the front and it would leave Pacific Northwest and come down to the bay. Well, they brought this into the bay and went to the South Bay and kind of put it in the mud at low tide and put a, um, what do you call it? Uh, a boom, a cable boom around it. High tide comes, breaks the boom. And they talked about this massive thing like it was a herd of animals. And they, and they said when the boom broke, logs were running out of the break, the breach, like a, a herd of sheep. And they, and they started calling it a school of logs. These logs crushed small boats like eggshells. They were an extreme hazard and they dispersed. The main portion of this raft went to the bottom of Petrera Hill near the Union Ironworks. 
and drifted into the mud. One sea captain said that they were um, 500 logs between Bolinas and Lime Point, which is where the Golden Gate Bridge is. 500 logs. And some were being washed out to see if they caught the current. Um, you know, this, just to think about this happening, uh, and this wasn't a one-time event. So this is at the end of August, and the excitement continues. Now, you can't almost see the end of this thing. This is before it was cabled and, and left. So these things were massive. And here we have some of the results of that very thing. The Oakland Ferry crashed into, uh, the Oakland Ferry, um, I'm sorry, the ferry boat named Oakland came out of San Francisco and was on its way to the Oakland Pier when it hit a portion of, these, of, of a log raft. Everyone was hurled from their seats onto the deck and there was this moment of silence and then, as, as they wrote it in 1905, women shrieked and men cursed. I mean, you gotta, you gotta love that. And then they, then they ran for the life preservers. Uh, the captain with a cool head just had the wheelman back the craft up and go forward again. And they made it to the Oakland Wharf only a few minutes late, but everybody, every passenger was extremely pale and holding on to those life preservers like their life still depended on it. And you'll notice over here, uh, an, a log, an individual log got caught in a propeller, and this time it was the key route ferry called San Francisco, and it was coming out of San Francisco right as it went around Goat Island. Now, where is Goat Island now? Come on, you're San Francisco, huh? Is it Treasure Island? Treasure Island was made for the 1939 fair, but you're close. Alcatraz. Pardon me? Alcatraz. Good guess, Yerba Buena. Uh -huh. Yerba Buena. They added Treasure Island onto Yerba Buena. So they were rounding Yerba Buena, and, and it, the propeller got caught in the log, and it started to twist the whole boat and everyone thought it was gonna turn over and they would have been thrown into the waves. Uh, once again, women shrieked and some fainted and men began grabbing life preservers. I mean, I gotta love this simple reality. Uh, and the deck hands came up and said, there's no danger and, and they made it to port. They, they were just beginning to study earthquakes at the turn of the century and it seems like there's a lost record because on the left, there was an earthquake that went for 40 seconds. Four, Loma Prieta was 10 to 15 seconds. Imagine something four times as long as that. That's pretty incredible. Um, and the interesting thing is, along with the length of this, the movement of the earth was like four to 40 times more than normally happened but there wasn't a lot of damage and there's a reason for that. The reason is that the movement didn't hit any obstructions, so it just moved fluidly. If it had hit an obstruction, the motion of the earthquake would have turned into one of those swirling motions, which I'm sure many of you have experienced. The second one, heavy midnight shock, um, I find even more amazing. The vibration went on for 12 minutes. Now, we, everyone keeps thinking, well, 1906, 19, well, this was 1900. You know, was this a precursor? Um, there was one jolt, but, but f 12 minutes. And both of these, the movement was east-west, which is fascinating because the Hayward Fault runs north-south. Um, so we'll let, we'll let the, um, uh, the seismologists explain that. Uh, the thing I found, I, I enjoyed reading was the professor at Cal, who was kind of in charge of all this, made sure he had a seismograph at his house as well as the lab. You know, that's my kind of guy. Uh, so he was right there to record everything and he had it the moment it happened. 
Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this. Uh, few things are more hidden from our view than the natural world as it was even 100 years ago. These news articles reveal that in 1900, Berkeley was still home to wild animals. The battle the, the area's animals fought and lost to humans, to the Spanish in their cruelty and domination, and to the Yankees in their numbers and their commodity view of nature, was nearly completed by the 1870s. The Gazette, that's the newspaper, vividly describes the final interactions between humans and the area's larger mammals. By the first decade of the 1900s, the last descendants of these animals' ancestral lines flickered and lurched towards local extinction. Those remaining animals struggled to survive in the middle and at the edges of this frontier outpost that was quickly becoming a city. As animals and humans competed for ever-shrinking available land, residents strategized how to eliminate these wild and domesticated animals. Poisoning of unwanted animals was common. Stealing animals was also common. We, were, we are encouraged, however, to read that the Berkeley residents made efforts to ensure that the animals in its public shelters were treated decently. For wild animals, on balance, the tone of many of the news articles shows the residents were both fearful and excited by their brushes with these invaders, which is what they were often called. Now on the left, uh, the early days were fine for shooting. I mean, before the coyotes were driven back, howling beyond the hills, and you could catch the quail by merely putting salt on their tails. Most everybody had animals, and there wasn't this uh, as clear a boundary between the inside of the house and the outside. Um, now, hold on to your hearts on this one. Um, this talks about, there, you know, there were whaling ships based in Oakland, and they would go up for a year and a half to the Arctic and, and come back. So the local papers would report on it. So in 19, was that 1900, um, this one ship brought back 27 bowhead whales. And the way they described it, 48,000 pounds of whale. That, that, I mean, if that's not a commodity view of nature, I don't know what is. Bowhead whales are slow swimmers. Um, and this is about the time that whaling was banned for U.S. whalers. A, a bowhead whale would live 200 years. It could hold its breath for 400, for, I'm sorry, 40 minutes. If you take 27 bowheads that were slaughtered times 200 years, that's 5,400 years of life eradicated. And why? Uh, and, and these whales were the most adapted whales to Arctic conditions, but they, were, they had no need to go fast in their world. The Americans and the whaling ships, yeah, they kind of, they took the oil, it was lubrication and such, but what they really wanted was what they called whale bone. And it wasn't really the bones of the whales, it was the baleen filters in their mouth. And the reason was, it was like the plastic of the day because it was, it was flexible and yet strong and didn't break. So what they made out of it was umbrellas, corsets, skirt hoops, fishing poles. And back then the guy said, oh, it's worth 150,000. Now that's five and a half million. Um, and it's sobering to see, it's kind of a precursor to the, the amazing uses, sadly, of plastic and how um, drawn in, we got. Now, every now and then a whale comes in the bay now and it's a big front page news. Well, when the Spanish first showed up in the 17, late 1700s, there were so many whales in the bay, no doubt breeding still, that they, they document, and the Spanish were incredible record keepers. They documented that there were so many whales in the bay that the air smelled of their spout. 
Walking around on land, you could smell the whale spout. That's how many there were. Um, even by 1900, there's records through the newspaper, otherwise forgotten, of a whole pods of whales still coming in the bay. And when you read these accounts, um, you know, this guy Harry Johnson was off uh, the Folsom Street Wharf and he sees something and then in the next thing he knows, he sees a whale blowing water uh, out its spout and then it dives and heads towards the Alameda shore. Um, I, and you know, they would talk about the whales infesting the bay and if they didn't leave soon, they were gonna take care of them. And what they were doing was they were, like two of them would go on either side of a ship or one would go underneath the prow of the ship and lift it up and then go around the stern, the back of the ship, blow its spout and dive. I've read so many of these interactions that I really believe this was like an animal's official ceremony of we're coming in to the bay, you're here too. They were trying to work something out. I don't know whether they felt it was their home or they were coming into the, you know, the floating village people's home. But these were no accidents, these were no, and, and, and the humans didn't begin to understand or get it. They were gonna kill them if they didn't leave, you know. Um, back in, I'm sure you've all been hiking and you've seen garter snakes, you know, foot, foot and a half. Well, back in 1900, which is not that long ago, in the downtown of Berkeley, in a barn, there was a four and a half foot garter snake. And this guy who had a, a repair shop saw it and naturally he killed it. And he hung it in his window, four and a half feet garter snake. Now you should also know that in the 1870s, there was a teenage boy who went up in the Berkeley Hills to go hunting. And he sees a bear hibernating in its den, a grizzly bear, young bear, kills it. Naturally, in the American way, we honor it by killing it and then naming Grizzly Peak. You know, bad trade, bad trade. Um, up in Santa Rosa, there was this hunter out in the field and he sees this giant eagle when they didn't normally see eagles there. And it swoops down and it's so big it grabs a lamb and it's trying to gain airborne with this lamb in its claws and the lamb is screaming. And the hunter hears this and runs over, you know, reached him and he couldn't just watch. So the eagle is still rising so he takes a, a shot at the periphery of the eagle and wounded it and it lets the lamb go. And he's coming over to the lamb and the eagle attacks his face with its claws and he's forced to shoot it at close range. This eagle had a seven foot wingspan, seven foot wingspan. In addition, remember that reservoir we were talking about? A bear the size of a Newfoundland dog Bigger, bigger than Bombay, <laughs> came and um, there, there was this guy there, Ellie Crocker, and he saw it and this bear let him come within 10 feet before the bear, he had no fear, but when he tried to get closer than 10 feet, the bear went into the bushes. In the 1870s, um, and, they, and they said the bear was sleek and fat, probably from raiding chicken coops. In the 1870s, a grizzly bear came down Strawberry Canyon towards the town. And you can imagine what happened to that. I just wanted to give you a close up. This came out of someone's personal photo collection who lived right near that reservoir. They caught a bear. I don't, you know, I can't tell you that it's the same one, not the same one, I don't know. But boy, it sure is fat and sleek and it looks pretty smart and pretty happy, except for the chain. Um, articles that showed you that the rural outpost of Berkeley changing into a city, there's a lot of articles that basically talk about that without saying as much. They instigated an ordinance where you couldn't have more than two cows per acre. 
This one guy had five, and they were going to cite him, and he said, well, wait a minute. I only have five at night, but in the day, there's only two, and I put the other three somewhere else, and he was fighting it. Um, on the right is the entrance of modern technology. Um, in Hayward? Hayward, yeah. Uh, this Ladies Improvement Club the, the soil in Hayward is really fertile, and there was a lot of weeds growing, and there were weeds growing on the Lady Improvement Club's lot. So they hire this guy with this newfangled thing called a weed killer, and you put it in a tank, a sprayer, add some water, and he liberally applied it to everything. Two days later, there's, there's a guy who lives you know, a few doors down, uh, Joe Cordoa, and he had two daughters, and part of their chores was to go around the empty lots and cut just enough grass on empty lots to feed the cattle that day, and that was their chore. Well, that day, they went to the lot on the Ladies' Improvement Club, cut down enough of the weeds, fed it to the cows, and the cows died. And nobody knew why for a little bit till they figured it out. Uh, well, welcome to the modern world. Um, people were killing animals left and right when they were annoyed. Uh, someone fed a cow paint, forced it to eat paint, which killed it. Um, the, the article on the right is, is staggering because it shows you the free reign that industry had over everything, including the safety of children. There were slaughterhouses in Emeryville, and the steer were, were stampeded down Alcatraz Avenue from the hills where they were being raised. And on Alcatraz Avenue was the Lauren School. So you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of steer stampeding right down the street where there's a school. And sometimes they got out of control and went into three smaller groups and were running rampant around the neighborhood. A neighbor saw this, ran to the school to protect the door with his life so they couldn't hurt the kids, and yelled for the principal to alert him not to let any kids out. And you know the neighbors complained and they were saying, you know, you're gonna have to find another street not our street, somebody else's street. Um, but it's just staggering what was allowed back then. Can you imagine that now? Steers running in the schoolyard, stampeded. Um, dogs were poisoned left and right. And some guys put poison out all over the block so multiple dogs were killed overnight. And, you know, there's, there's this one savant dog that, could do math and see colors and, you know, supposedly, and uh, he, he was well-loved and he was poisoned. Um, the pound, I don't even want to talk about what they did killing the animals there, and, um, but the SPCA got their guy to be the pound master and they were hoping that things would change. Uh, now, this is one of my favorites. What page is this? 25. Um, this, this is such a great article. Too many dogs in Berkeley. Colonel George C. Edwards of the Mathematics Department of the University of California complained to the police department this morning about the prevalence of unlicensed canines in the town of Berkeley. The colonel stated that the campus and the streets of the city were overrun with mangy curs. Put your hands over Bombay's ears. I don't, want to, I don't want him hearing this. Uh, mangy curs, and he wanted the poundmaster to be instructed to eliminate as many of the stray dogs as he could during the next month or two. Edwards thought that not enough captures were made by the poundmaster, Ryan. And as a result, the number of dogs in town was becoming uncomfortable. After making his plea against the larger size of dog population, Colonel Edwards produced $4, the fines of two of his dogs who were at that moment in the pound. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 
This is Marshall Vollmer. He's known all over the world as one of the biggest innovators of policing. Um, he invented the first lie detector. He, he uh, invented record keeping so they could know criminals from outside of Berkeley when they arrived. He was an amazing guy, but he was also very humane. He would find, you know, if he came upon a drunk, he wouldn't arrest them, he would walk them home. And that's part of that is being in a small town. He probably knew them. I knew a lady named Madeline Tagg um, and interviewed her when she was about mid-90s. Madeline Tagg and her friends who lived near the police station would go into Marshall Vollmer's office while he was working and just sit and play. Can you imagine that happening now? Just kids wandering into the police chief's office and sitting down and making a ruckus and playing. He didn't mind. So there was a lot of, you know, comical quote unquote arrests that the, that the uh, newspaper showed. There was a lot of bicyclists on the sidewalk, um, which seems to be more and more of a current topic. One of the things I found that I had never ever thought about is the only time a person's ethnicity was brought up is if they weren't white or thought of as white. If you were Italian, they would say this Italian guy. But if you weren't Italian and you were white, it was not even mentioned. So they mentioned, oh, it's a Japanese cyclist. And I thought, wow, I never even thought about that. But there it is right in front of our eyes. Now, that's not to say that this bicyclist wasn't wrong. He badly injured this guy by running into him on the sidewalk, and the guy might not recover. Um, but that's what I wanted to bring up. Um, now, Mott wants no bicycles on sidewalk. M Mott was the mayor of Oakland, and the city council passed an ordinance about bicycle riding on the sidewalk, and part of it said, if a bicyclist approaches a pedestrian on the sidewalk, he has to dismount and walk by the pedestrian. And Mott said, no, -uh, I'm not passing this because I know human nature enough that that cyclist is not gonna dismount. This is ridiculous. Put him in the street. Put the bikes in the street. And then a teacher was arrested as well for riding on the sidewalk. Now, a brave girl uh, was home alone teenager. Her parents were out for the night, and she hears the doorbell ring, and she looks out the curtains, and she sees this guy she doesn't know, so she wasn't going to open the door, and he rings again, and she doesn't answer. 20 minutes later, some other guy in a slouch hat shows up, and he rings the door, and she looks, so she couldn't be seen, and looks at him. Now she's scared. She's home by herself, she goes on the second floor where she has a better vantage point and she sees the two guys go around the back some 20 minutes later and one of them was lifting the second one in the back hallway window. So this girl, home alone by herself, scared but works through it, opens the window and with these magic words yells, scoot! And that scared these two grown men so much <laughs> that they ran away and never came back. And she just stayed up waiting for her parents to come home. So remember that. Scoot! That will work. Um, w whereas uh, a descendant of one of the Berkeley pioneers heard something in the chicken coop and took a revolver out and shot, and the guy dropped the chicken and ran. Um, so there's all kinds of things. It was very common to empty Indian shell mounds for fertilizer and roadbed, and um, here this guy's happy to sell the Indian shell mounds, and the university even analyzed it for the guy as to its fertilizer value. This is the old Indian burial grounds in Berkeley, where, where they would have had a summer camp village. Um, don't think, you know, a lot of this sounds so innocent and all. Well, here's Jack the Hugger. Now, this guy would come out at between 7 and 10 at night in a certain area, neighborhood, 
and he would just walk up to a woman and give her a gentle hug and then run. <laughs> well, this terrified the women. They didn't know what to expect and everybody was afraid to go outside. And once he came up with four women together and he just gave one a gentle hug. They all started screaming and he ran off. Police couldn't catch him. Now, here's another great one. Gather in the hobos. What you learn from reading this article is, back then, turn of the century, the police were paid $2 a hobo for bringing him into the court. That's the harder part of the job. The, the, the judge was paid $3 to throw the hobo into jail. So he had the easy job. He got three bucks, the policeman got two. You wanna make a little money? Convict more hobos. Of what crime? Pardon me? Of what crime? Vagrancy? Lloyd, I don't know, they'll find something, it's three bucks. Google how much three bucks is worth now, you know? Um, there were fake gas men, you know, gas was, coming into play at the turn of the century. And some guy was running around Berkeley pretending he was from the gas company. So this is all very modern stuff, unlike some of the other things which we can't believe happened so soon. So it's not many years ago since most of our population, with the exception of college people, a small number of wealthy residents and tradesmen derive their support through or from San Francisco, meaning they commuted on the ferries to work low white collar jobs. In those days, after the morning trains had borne the wage workers, the clerks and businessmen to the city, there were few signs of life in the little town. The children were at school, the boys and girls at the university were engaged in their studies. The housewives were busy with their domestic duties and the streets were so deserted that one might have fired a cannon down the main avenue without fear of hitting anything. Put your ears over his hands. <laughs> anything more important than a stray dog. <laughs> the population was growing rather at a good clip. They needed more buildings, schoolhouses. And you can see on the bottom left, there's Ocean View School. Now I've read reminiscences of people who went to Ocean View School and um, Schoolhouse Creek was just to the north of it and it was covered with willows because it was a damp area. And the kids would go under the willows for lunch every day by the creek and have their lunch. Pretty amazing, huh? Now, grammar teachers are scarce, just like today. What's fascinating about this article, you know, and they used to get them from UC Berkeley and they, they, they were not getting the number they used to and that they needed. And what they were doing was trying to attract men to be teachers as well. But they didn't just say men should be teachers. They said, men should be teachers because then we'll make you a principal. You know, they couldn't just be teachers. They had to have some more authority. I thought that was pretty amazing. Now, brownie cameras were just beginning. So probably very few people had them. There was a guy who had a carriage and this goat and he went around the town and you could put your kid in that carriage, you know, I don't know, 50 cents, whatever, and have the kid's picture taken with the goat carriage. Well, watch this. Take a good look at that goat, take a good look at that carriage. I think we got two kids in the same, from the same guy. Uh, I went back and forth on these photos many times. And then there's the pioneers kids, you can see he made that one himself. This is University Avenue, Lower University Avenue. Now, I'm putting this in here. How many of you, after working all day, would bathe when you had to heat the, the water with wood from a wood, with wa water heated on a wood-burning stove that much? The effort, the expense, the time I think that's one of the reasons bathing practices were different. And notice the goats in the house. This is little Ruth Witherspoon uh, having a great time with the hose, probably watering her family's crops. And 
This wouldn't have happened 10 years earlier because there wouldn't have been pressurized running water. So this is all the future coming to life. Now we don't think about it. So first we eliminate and kill all the animals. And then it's so exciting, let's bring in the circus with wild animals. And the kids loved it. They didn't have computers or TVs or, you know, and they got a lot of excitement out of this. You probably, you probably didn't know that Berkeley was the nation's center for the anti-vaccination movement. I swear, I've done a lot of research on this. And um, smallpox was killing, you know, tens of thousands of people all around the world. And it was starting to break out. But back then, the vaccine was you scrape some skin off and put this um, uh, serum from a cow and put it on this wound, and that would make you uh, immune to smallpox. And the medical people, you know, felt they had proved that, but you had to keep the wound clean. And some kids died because their wounds got infected. And that just set so many people, excuse me, off uh, that they didn't want to have the vaccine. So the school board said, look, if you don't have the vaccine, you're going to infect these other kids. So you can't come. Then these people felt so strongly they opened their own school. And that's a pretty good solution. You know, if that's what you choose, at least you're not infecting everybody else. Um, there were shootings. Kids were getting shot. But when you read these articles, they're pretty much all accidents. Um, there's, there's not the violence that we're, we're plagued with. Um, now, one of the saddest articles, children die from diphtheria. This family, uh, the Mushaf family, was going to vacation in Santa Cruz. They had four kids. They got on the train on their way to Santa Cruz, and there was some kid on that train that was ill. By the time the train got to Santa Cruz, all four kids were ill. Two, they all had diphtheria. It, you know, in a matter of hours, on the way to a vacation, two didn't survive and two recovered. I mean, that's part of the way life was back then. Um, you know, even the gangs, they, they had a place where they drank whiskey and smoked to feel like adults. And, you know, what did they do? Well, they mischievously robbed contractors, job sites and things like that for fun. That sounds still pretty innocent. My favorite, one of my favorite articles was a bundle of rope was stolen from the back of a contractor's wagon and they put a detective on the case. <laughs> I mean, you gotta love that. Now, arrested for jumping trains. This is way more serious than it sounds. Um, a lot of times, if the stop was here and you lived a block before the stop, people would jump off the train and it would be slowing down. But it is so easy to misjudge the speed of a train or to hit the ground and lose your footing that many people were just thrown under the wheels and killed. So they had to do something to stop this because it was so prevalent. Or to jump off before you paid your fare. So many people were killed, they made this ordinance. Now, here you have, kids weren't supervised like they are today. There was a kid playing on the railroad tracks on Shattuck Avenue in the downtown, no adult around, and here comes the train. And this lady looks out her window and sees what's happening. She rushes down, puts her life on the line, and grabs the kid just as the train comes by. Took a lot of courage. Uh, wagons were hit by the trains. Um, the horses would hear a funny noise, something that scared them or saw something, and they would bolt, throwing people from wagons as well. Um, it, was, it was a wild place for an animal. Um, this ad says it all. If you were Chinese American, you could get a job as a cook, a waiter, or a houseboy. Um, so, 
th the racism was incredible. And those little kids I was telling you, the, it sounded, the gangs sounded so naive crime, you know, a little gang and they're just drinking whiskey and smoking. Those were the same kids that were throwing rocks at a Chinese workman walking down the street and they would harass him seriously. And a lot of Chinese male workers felt so threatened that they carried guns. And I found one article where they were pelting him with rocks and he took a gun out, you know, because he thought his life was in danger. So this was a tough time. In addition to being a naive time, depends on where you were. Here's six women in the North Berkeley Hills, notice the uh, peacock, and the woman third from the left, you know, some people say, what is that, a gang sign? Well, I think she's just pretending she's picking her nose to be funny. Big, big joke in 1900. And, and her friends thought it was very funny. Now, women have the blues and they have fallen uteruses and ovarian troubles. And, um, and yet, women were doing these incredible things. And I'm glad they had this article about African-American women's gathering to talk about some issues they wanted to resolve. Um, here you see the same dress and blouse that Mary Shapelin had on, not revealing their ankles, thank God. And there was a basketball court paid for by Phoebe Hurst outside, first one. The fence was 12 feet, and I guarantee you it wasn't to catch basketballs. It was, it was to block the eyes of the male students. Women were nervous. They were filling up the hospitals. And yet, that's the advertisements, that's what they wanted you to believe, but the reality, these, there were so many women that were so brave, it's unbelievable. This woman was out in, the, in, in a bay in Mendocino, and a, and a star cow football player jumps in the water and for whatever reason goes unconscious. This woman saved his life. This guy was playing football with broken bones. He didn't get out of the, you know, he was a tough guy. But this woman saved his life. This, another woman rescuing an infant just in the nick of time. Everybody thought they were both killed. On, they were on the other side of the train. So you can see that although the ads say women were frail, the other side of this is there were so many women who were incredibly brave. No more blasting after 8 p.m. Can you imagine someone in your neighborhood yeah. using, yeah, right, yes, I can, very good. And that's the realistic answer. Exploding dynamite all night long, like a couple blocks from your house. The Spring Construction Company was, made a lot of roads in Albany and Berkeley. And there was so much work, they were blasting 24 hours a day. So finally, they weren't allowed to blast after 8 p.m. People were going without sleep, you know? Uh, carrots studded with gold. This is another thing I love about these old papers. They always gave you a sense of wonder and excitement. Um, some guy bought a bunch of carrots and he looks at them and there's gold dust on them. They find out where they were grown and everybody's out there to make their fortune. Now, did anybody grow up reading Ripley's Believe It or Not? <laughs> yeah, great. Well, I grew up reading Ripley's Believe It or Not and I was just fascinated by it. And here's an article that belongs in Ripley's Believe It or Not. In Campeche, in Mexico, the Indians there spoke a dialect and when people from Turkey came, they understood them completely. And within a couple of weeks, we're speaking their language fluently. Well, I got two questions. How did that happen? Number one, and number two, what's the story about people from Turkey going to Mexico in 1900? I, I, I never heard of you know, the, the influx of this and why. And then you read, it looks to be as difficult a problem as that of explaining the discovery in the, in the state of Oaxaca of Egyptian and Chinese idols. <laughs> Ripley's Believe It or Not. Let's talk about love and marriage. We have a guy named Charles Goodwin. And 
this is at the time of the Spanish-American War, and there were a lot of patriotic Berkeley boys that were signing up to go fight in the Philippines. Charles Goodwin was one of them. And he met this gal named, I think it's Mary Schaefer. Yeah, and um, promised to marry her. He's over there fighting for two years, and this was a brutal, brutal, brutal war. He's over there for two years, he comes home, he takes another bride. Well, this is something to show you that the, the mindset that surrounds us, the culture, makes the world totally different. Mary, Mary sued him, took him to court, because he gave his word he gave his word to marry her. And the judge said, five years in San Quentin. The courts are growing more strict in the enforcement of laws relating to matrimony and inclined to allow Cupid to change his mind only by mutual consent. <laughs> I think we've, I think we've, uh, are in a different world now. We're surrounded by the same humans, but that, cultural fog. Now, poor Mrs. Hickox, who was a UC Berkeley student at one time, he stopped washing his face for months, or for weeks, and he didn't bathe for months. And when Mrs. Hickox was feeling ill, he still made her tend to his horse. <laughs> she said, I want a divorce. And you would think this is a no-brainer, right? Irreconcilable differences. The suit for a divorce was thrown out of court by Judge Budd, who held that the infrequent ablutions of Hickox were not grounds enough for granting a divorce. My, how times were changed. Now, Man of Mystery Marries, that's page 144. This is so Berkeley, I have to read it for you. Thorington Chase, detective, government scout, astrologer, mental, telepo, te, mental telepathist, violinist, ad solicitor, and for a brief time UC student, is married. At least it is presumed from the following dispatch, and it's from his father's ranch in Missouri. Man of mystery left here some three months ago and his friends were in doubt as to whether he had received a message from Mars or was simply going to do some ranch work and attend to the livestock on his father's farm in the Osho in the Shomi State. Chase, while here, went by the name of Thorington Clark Chase and frequently regaled his friends with weird tales of his adventures by land and sea and his communications even with the stars. His first advent at the university was marked by the now famous crocodile advertising, which was the freakiest ever seen in the state. This is 1905 and they're using the word freakiest. This is, it's mind boggling. Um, Many businessmen who know him by no other name will remember him as the Crocodile Man. He was a fine violinist, which he was, and organized a class at one of the UC cottages. Several months ago, he left Berkeley with the announcement that he was going to South America called by some great detective mission from the government. It subsequently developed that he had gone to Mare Island and was in some employment in the Naval Department. Chase made a number of friends here who will be pleased to know that he is married and hope he will settle down and cut out the mythical and mysterious. Now, if that's not a Berkeley story, I, I don't know what is. Spuds for the poor. The way people were relating to the poor was based more on practical experience, whereas now we base it on belief systems. They we're dealing with human nature and we're dealing with human morals and it's very, very, very different. So the women of San Francisco uh, were setting up a pingree potato patch plan which started in Detroit where poor people would work and grow potatoes and th it, it, they believed that it allowed them a much better feeling to work for what they received and it was much better for everybody, especially 
the poor. And it's fascinating, paupers much work, must work in Marin County. So the poor farm in Marin County said the same thing, that they're not gonna be feeding anybody anymore unless they, they worked. Um, so this was a whole movement. And uh, in, in Berkeley 1900, um, in, the, in the emergency earthquake camps, if you didn't accept a job, they let you go one time. If you didn't accept the second job, they cut your rations in half. It's, then they would kick you out. In the Claremont District, a very famous, fancy, rich section, what impresses strangers visiting here is the outside houses, as one lady claimed, artistic houses, I'm sorry. It, why, even the rich have good taste. <laughs> Everything was about houses. These are all middle-class houses in the flats. Um, you know, all the farms were going. Uh, here's sales of farms. Here's some photos of the last farms. Here's College Avenue, and what is it paved with? The street and the sidewalk? Indian Shell Mound. There's a photographic proof. Um, this is the burial grounds in Thousand Oaks. It's a, it's a selling thing for real estate. Uh, now we'll go to medicine. Friend James the Healer giving an open air concert, corner of Shattuck and Channing, teeth extracted publicly free and painless. Teddy the little white dog climbs and jumps from the high ladder. Performance begins at 7.30. <laughs> um, now the bottom one, small boys are not allowed to compound your prescription when bought when brought to this pharmacy. Only registered pharmacists are employed. That makes you feel safe. That means that kids who weren't pharmacists were compounding prescriptions. No big deal, right? Uh, these guys selling patent medicines made a min of money. They were gonna stay a week, they stayed seven. Uh, San Francisco pulled a patent medicine from the shelves, found it to be 96 point 98.6% water, sulfuric acid, sulfurous, and a trace of formaldehyde and pulled it. Um, electric shampoo. Uh, electricity was the new invention. I guarantee you, mark my words, next year there's gonna be AI shampoo. <laughs> I, sh I, I promise you. California wheat teen is digestible because being free from fiber and thinly flaked, it's easily assimilated. Free from fiber because it's di it, fiber is not digestible. Um, and, and this is a thing of how automobile, when you got behind the wheel of an automobile, you became a monster. And you killed, you had no care for human life. Um, and this sounds so modern. People back east were lining up and pelting the autos. Uh, people in Oakland wouldn't sell them gasoline. They were hated. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess we can, if there's time to take questions, if not. Now we can take one or two questions. Who would like to, to ask? Or are you so stunned and <laughs> exhausted? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I have a question. Right, uh, right at the beginning, you talked about the, um, the shape of the sand. Yes in Alameda and the, the Berkeley beach. Bath Beach, the, yes. Yeah, uh, do you know geologically why? Well, I happened? can tell you generally. What, what would make that yeah, sand? The, the longer sand has been tumbled, the rounder it would get. So this was newer sand that had just been ground off and it was more angular. I had a laugh when you said, used the word scoot. Yeah, because uh, that was my father's nickname. I have uh, 11 really? brothers and sisters, and he called the oldest, my oldest brother, Scoot. He called the second one, Scoot, Scoot. And he called the third one, Scoot, Scoot, Scoot. And, you know, but you couldn't tell who he was calling by the time you got to the eighth or ninth ones, obviously. Wow. Nobody could count. So now... Who would like to ask the last question? Yeah. Go ahead. Anybody? Anybody want to know what's going to happen in Berkeley 2100? Richard has that answer waiting for him. Uh, and I, I, I want to dedicate this talk to Andrea, 
who loved black and white photos and was a very loved um, member of our community at, who founded Photo Lab and is still run by the family. Um, and my friend Robert Rooney, who spent his life in the book business and would always advise me and would answer questions about the Philadelphia Eagles lineman's weight and <laughs> any detail I wanted. So I'm dedicating this to those two folks. Well, thank you very much, Richard.